As Kevin mentioned, my name is Ronnie, and you read my bio. I've been at the Cape Town Baptist Seminary for a while. And so a lot of what I'm going to share today is more from experience that I've had and some of the lessons I've learned looking at this challenge of moving from classroom to application. A lot of the things that we've heard uh, in, the, in the, the things that, today from uh, Dr. Lawless just now and Trevor earlier and Dr. Burroughs, so we've heard a lot of this already. But I think that for our point of view, we need to understand that the challenge is a real challenge. It is, it is one of the primary tasks that we need to come and, and grapple with. And I think we've already heard a number of times, I don't need to reiterate, but once again we see that discipleship is a target. And this I think was what uh, Ryan said earlier in this week and kind of set that tone very early. And we've heard others repeat that. Well, if, if we say that, then that means that essentially... The degree in and of itself is, is not the end. Again, I think Dr. Lawless expressed that very well just now. It does not mean that uh, we ignore the, the desire of having a degree, but we realize that that's not the primary purpose. Rather, we are equipping people for God, the ministry which God has called them to. And there's this opportunity of us discipling them, um, engaging with them as they do that journey. And I think constantly, I know for myself, it's just always this balance of how do you, how do you balance the, the academic value and the, the ministry impact in that discipleship development? Are we, are we discipling students to be effective in following the call of God upon their life and following Jesus, right? And I have to be honest, for me, sometimes it's kind of easy to kind of lose sight of the goal in the midst of the process. I, I think back to my early lectures in particular. I was the guy who was so worried about making sure I got through all the curriculum because that's what I was you know, told to do. And that became often like the focus. And I, would, and I would make sure I got everything right and I'd often miss some of the things that God was doing in our very midst because I was so focused on making sure I got all my, all my lessons in. So now, if, we'll see if the video works. I got a little test for you. We'll see if it works. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. But, did you see the moonwalking bear? Go! See, sometimes it's easy to miss things that we're not exactly looking for, right? And I think this is, this is one of the lessons that I learned very early. I was getting things done, but I wasn't always paying attention to what God was doing in our classrooms, right? And so for me, I think we have to think and, and, and realize that we need a strategy and intentionality about movement from classroom to field. And so what I basically want to look at and kind of share with you some of the strategies that I've gleaned over my time at the seminary. Hopefully I'm, I'm better now than I was when I first started out some uh, 19 plus years ago or whatever. And so we're going to be looking at these three aspects that, for me, have become quite crucial as I wrestle with this idea, and that's going to be prayer, uh, planning, and presence. See, I, I also can do some alliteration. So. <laughs> well, let's look at prayer. Now, that, I know this sounds like, oh, duh. But I think seriously, for me, this, is, this has got to be a starting point. The, the, the call to abide, and I think, again, Dr. Uh, Lawless mentioned this, as a lecturer, we are first and foremost followers of Jesus Christ. We are disciples of Jesus. And it's easy to get so busy and stuff that we can neglect our own time, our own relationship with God. Personally, I believe that everything begins with this abiding in Christ. And so that means in the context of a lecturer, 
I am a lecturer because I responded to God's call in my life. Therefore, that needs to be fed. That needs to be a part of what I'm doing. Always is spending time first with God because the task that I'm doing is in response to his call. And he is the one that empowers me to complete that task. Not my degree or charisma or whatever else. Now, I have to be honest that sometimes, I don't know if anybody else, perhaps it's just me, when you're teaching the same course multiple times, for example, I think this is the 19th time I'm teaching Greek 1 and Greek 2 and the 10th time for teaching New Testament introduction, you know, the temptation is there to just rely on the notes you already have. And I'm not saying you have to rewrite all the notes because, believe it or not, the Greek alphabet stays the same from year to year. But <laughs> the thing is, is not to simply rely on, well, where was I at in God with it before? It's, but rather, constantly engaging your material. And for me, that is a part of this time of prayer. Because my goal is not simply to complete the class, Right? Although I am moving through a content and there's certain, certain things I want to get to, but for example, when we have the Greek exegesis of 1 Peter, I don't think I've ever actually finished the whole book because we get caught up in so many things in, in unpacking words and phrases as well as how this can move into teaching and sermon and other, and other you know, Christology class. That sometimes there's other dynamics that happens that they're still learning the process of how to translate well, but sometimes you can build up and have more completeness without rushing through the content. I think there's a, a kingdom focus, a disciple-making focus, and an obedience to our calling. For the student, we need to help them understand it's not just about getting the final degree or getting the paper, but it's about being equipped for the calling that God has, has placed upon their life. Now, this is a lesson I had to learn while still a student at Southern Seminary. We had, we had a ridiculously bizarre grading system. It was one of those, you got A plus A, A minus, B plus B. And so you had this 12-point system, and an A was like from 96 to 100, that range. And so I remember you could theoretically get a, an A plus if you got like a 99. Now, again, that doesn't like normally happen. But I was in this one class, and I had figured out, I was there, and so I was, I was so excited, ready to get my marks, and I was going to have my first A+. Plus. It was in a Greek exegesis class, you know? And I got my report card, and they forgot to put the plus on there, right? It just, it just had the A, and I know I had an aggregate of 99. And so I, in my righteousness, was quite angry. And I go to the grader and say, surely he has made a mistake. He said, no, no, our professor, you have to get 100 on everything before he'll give you the A+. Plus. So now I go back to my room, and I'm ranting, man. I'm just, ah, the injustice of it all, right? And I feel God encounter me at that moment. And he's saying, Ronnie, why exactly are you mad? Well, I didn't get my plus. He's like, well, did you learn anything? Well, well yeah. Actually, why did you take the class? Because, because I wanted to. Did you learn? Yes. That was the last time in my seminary career I ever looked at my marks. Because for me, I realized I had made it all about getting a mark and not being equipped. How do we help our students understand that it's not about simply achieving some mark, but being equipped for God's glory, for whatever God is calling them to, right? And so likewise, as a lecturer, I must also be aware of my calling. I am there not because... I, I think it's cool to be a teacher, but because God has called me to that task. And am I moving and acting in a way that helps to fulfill that calling in a way that brings glory to God? So there are at least three areas for me as I come to the task of praying that are very important. And one of those is, of course, in my course content. I mean, when I'm looking at a course, I spend a lot of time in prayer over that course I know you think, well, even if it's Greek thing, right? I mean, the Greek is fairly set out. But still, it's the question of how am I going to explain this? How, and those become prayerful moments. One of the things that comes out in our, in, our, in our context is we try to be aware of what's going on in our churches. What are some things that we're not addressing in our seminary? And so within the faculty meeting, we'll often talk about this. And, and this becomes a point of prayer. As we're engaging the students, as we're looking at our curriculum, what, where are the gaps? 
And so we begin, you know, praying. And in the context, and in fact, there's one I'll tell you about just a little bit later that was one of those that really came up. Now, I was always really good at these two points. I have to be honest that for an initial part of my time, I never really took seriously this task. Whereas now, as I come before, in the early part of the morning, I, I pray through each of my lectures for that day. Not because I don't feel I'm prepared, but because... I want to be open to what God is doing in that classroom. See, one of the things that I have learned so much over the years is that I often have skimmed over parts of Scripture that don't really engage with what I grew up or whatever, right? And I have learned so much from my students to say, oh, don't, let's don't go past this too fast. They have a much deeper appreciation for Old Testament than I did coming in. Or those New Testament books that talk about community and engagement, they get in a way that I, who grew up in America with a very individualistic perspective, often miss. So sometimes it's, I need to hear from them, and also sometimes we want to open up and, and have moments where God can augment our curriculum a little bit. I remember one, one class where my years at Southern never prepared me for this. We were going through our Old Testament survey, we got to the part where Saul, after Samuel had died, wanted to get advice from Samuel, so goes to the witch and asks to see him. And in the midst of that context, one of my students say, Doc, I want to ask you questions. Okay? He says, you know, every year on the anniversary of my grandfather's death, my family will pour some beer in a bowl, give it to the cow, and then my grandfather will speak from the cow. And I say, well... What do you think is going on? And he says, well, I know it's a demon. That's not my question, Doc. He says, how do I tell my parents that's a demon? And so suddenly we had a whole other discussion in the class, and my closest students began just pulling out and saying, okay, this is, and suddenly while it's still within the content of what happened, it added a whole other dimension. And had I just been worrying about rushing through my content, we would have missed that whole teachable moment. So my, my passion is I want to have prayer time so that I, as I teach, I want to be open to where God is moving and the questions. I don't want to simply rush past those moments. And so I think that that calls for us that question of abiding and bringing that with each class. Another thing we have to need to be is about planning. And here, uh, this is, is, I think, we, we heard a lot of this going on, looking at curriculum earlier today, Dr. Burrow and others uh, have said very, very uh, similar. But here it is, as we're planning, I really believe we need to intentionally ask some of the questions. And again, we heard them from uh, Dr. Lawless. And again, how am I making the connection from classroom to field? It doesn't just happen sporadically without us engaging that question. If we don't get intentional, we often just wind up with good intentions and the semester is gone, you know? I think we heard from Ryan Hutchinson that this purpose of discipleship, making disciples that make disciples, again, how are we doing that in the context of our classroom? I can remember at our, at our seminary, we have the same focus that I've heard over and again, this idea of training the head, the heart, and the hands. One of the things that we have in our syllabus, we have to show the components. How do we have these components in our syllabus? And, and, and while that's good, sometimes I have to admit Sometimes I can just do it out of an exercise if I'm not prayerfully moving through that. And so for me, I think a lot of the questions, we've already mentioned it, but this idea of contextualization is one that I wrestle with a lot. And there's a particular definition that I enjoy. It's a definition that we use in the church planning methodology class as well as probably my favorite class, which is evangelism in an urban context. And it's a, 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 a one that's, is used by Tim Keller to talk about gospel contextualization, but I think it has some applic applicability. This is what is, is when he looks at gospel contextualization. This is Keller's, Keller's definition. It is giving people the Bible's answers, which they may not want to hear, to questions about life that people in their particular time and place are asking in language and forms they can comprehend through appeals and arguments with force that they can feel even if they reject them. And so there's a couple elements from here that I really resonate with, which is, again, we've talked about the authority of Scripture as we engage that. We want Bible's answers, but the question I ask is, are we really answering questions that are coming from our churches? 
Are we bringing Bible answers to the questions that our students are wrestling with? What, what they're hearing in the classroom, is it really engaging what they're seeing on the field? So I think for us, if we don't have that dynamic that we're really wrestling with, what are they hearing and knowing? Are we going to be able to contextualize our classes for them so that we get out of the classroom? We don't want, as, as, as Dr. Dubé said, winding up with boxes that you take from place to place to place and ultimately just burn because they're no, not useful. That's not our desire. We want them to be able to move and apply so, are we answering the questions being asked by the students? And what does it look like to contextualize our curriculum? As Reverend Basera said earlier, we, are we able to defend the why of our courses? And I think we heard again, Dr. Mburo today, contextualization is not a once-off event. As we have new students come through and as we have new contexts, Anybody working in an urban context knows how quickly things shift, how quickly things change, and your whole people group may suddenly move. And for that reason, our students are often wrestling with how are we bringing, how are we being applicable. And I think for us to be aware and ask these questions of where are those touch points in our curriculum, in our content, that is, that is the meat that the students need to be able to do. And, and show them how to practically live that out. Now, for me, we, we talked a bit about uh, um, methods and learning, teaching. This, for me, is one that I resonate very well. This came from John Hendricks a long time ago. But looking at how people learn. It's when we had to take one of those classes in seminary uh, on teaching. and how This met, resonated with the idea is that we have, everybody has a starting point. With, with the material or what they're knowing, and much like we had with our cards, what, what do you expect to know? And we have an authority. We have, what does the Bible say about this matter? Very often I found that I would just jump to application with, okay, I, how do I help them apply it, and skip what is an incredibly important moment. At some point, we need to help people reflect, why is what Scripture says so far away from where I am? Why does that gap exist? What is it? So my application is about how do I close that gap? So if I'm dealing with content and there's not an understanding of where they need to be, well, then I need to look, well, do I need to teach it better? Do I need to move it? How, if we're not getting to the point of application, really, what's happening in the process? So for me, this challenge of creating and engaging with reflection on a genuine way to help people resonate with their, their place from where they know this is where they're supposed to be in Scripture, but this is where they are. What needs to happen for them to move? Sorry, you can't put two microphones here. That's just, <sighs> I could do them both and then we'd have stereo. But <laughs> So one of the tasks then is to facilitate genuine reflection between what is seen in the field and what is being heard in the classroom. And saying, how do we move in such a way that that gap is closed, that that gap is moved down? Sorry. And this is where we begin to question, is it, do I need to, to organize my coursework different? Do I need to, the way I lecture, the way I exams, one of the challenges I give my students all the time is to rethink the way they see exams. Instead of just this moment of fear, realize it's your moment of stewardship. You know, you're at the seminary because God called you here. You've been hearing le uh, lectures, you've been doing that. This is your moment to bring offering before God. And my prayer is always, God, may they, may, may they, may they perform as they, they've studied, as they prepare, not just give them answers. Right? But I think helping a complete reforming on their whole experience, it's all toward this being equipped. That's our challenge. So I want to give you a few examples from my experience and Sometimes I've done well, sometimes not so well, but just from those classes I teach most often. And this is what I mentioned is languages. I, well, I do Greek mainly because Doc Rinquist usually does Hebrew. When he's on sabbatical, I'll pick up the Hebrew um, because I was one, one of those bizarre people. 
that did my PhD in both because I couldn't decide which I like more because, you know, it's all Bible, right? So, so that's, that's why I go back and forth. But now this is one of those that, that particularly in the early years, we can see, you know, ways of getting applicable in the, when, they're, when they've learned enough and they can translate. But one of the questions that was asked, do, you know, do, do, they, do they really need Greek, right? And that's one that students, usually about three weeks in, and they're doing the quizzes, they're suddenly asking, do I really need Greek? So how do we help on an early stage seeing direct applicability? So yes, they can't translate much yet, but you know what they can do is they can begin doing word studies. And, and, and you can connect them, so I, so I challenge them, okay, the next Bible study you're preparing, I want you to pick out a key word, and let's do one word study together. Just so they can see on the very early stage, yes, they can't translate it all yet, but they can still find immediate application into their ministry and preaching and teaching, even when they're still walking in the early stages. And so this becomes challenge, you know, to, to help them move more. And then it is, you know, I want you to teach this. Right? Where are you going to teach it? Now, one of the challenges I always give them is you're not allowed to use the Greek word from the pulpit. You just got to give the meaning, right? Because, you know, sometimes people like to use a Greek word. So, so everybody out there knows I know more than you do, right? <laughs> and so the challenge is, can I, can I teach the content without having to result to, this is a, you know, present uh, passive indicative here. And we have to, we're going to be looking at this. No, 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 no. What does it mean? How can I, how can I get that to the meat? Again, I get all the fun classes, so you should be feeling sorry for my, my, the other lectures now, because I get to do all the biblical studies classes, you know. But this is one, again, both, whether it's overviews of the New Testament introduction, Old Testament introduction, or if it's exegetical book, the way you begin engaging content and coursework, the question is, how can I make sure this is immediately applicable? Because the goal of you teaching them how to do an exegesis isn't for an academic exercise, but the idea is you want them to be able to handle rightly the word of truth as they prepare to preach and teach. So part of the sermon isn't just, or part of the, 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 the task isn't just to do an exegesis, but from this, write for me a sermon. And then you go one step further. Okay, now where are you going to preach this? Now, I remember one year in chapel because they had to choose from the Sermon on the Mount. So every student preaching was preaching from the Sermon on the Mount, but that was okay. The idea is, is you want to help them to see that there is a, a viability, a connectivity between what they're hearing and how this will help them in following the calling that God has given them. And if you're doing a single book, you have a lot more freedom. If you're doing Romans, you can challenge them to do a series of sermons. Or my favorite book to teach is Job, actually. And what they have to write is a theodicy. In other words, how are they going to balance God is good, God is all-powerful, and suffering, suffering exists in their community. And so they have to write a theodicy for their church members if they're going to explain this. And so that becomes their big project. And so it's something that's immediately applicable for them. And they're forced to, I'm hearing this in the classroom, but you know what, we went out and another teenager was shot. And so what do I do when I go to that parent? Right? And so you're helping them to move and to to. to to wrestle with some of that. One of the other classes that, that is absolutely, again, a lot of fun to do is, is evangelism classes, and particularly this semester, I'm doing um, evangelism in an urban context. It's one of my favorite ones to kind of look at some of those dynamics. But again, the way this class actually came out, we had an evangelism class, and one of the things that we do at seminaries, we have cell groups with our students, and and in my particular cell group that year, there was a third-year student. And as we're talking about Great Commission, he makes a statement that he had ne he's never witnessed one-on-one -on -one to anybody. And, I, and I'm sitting there and he goes, dude, we can't have a third-year student. And he's like, well, you'll know, preach it. And this, I'm like, you've got to have this conversation. So I, the next faculty meeting, we start talking about this at faculty. say, this just can't happen, right? And so out of that came, let's, let's re-envision how we're doing the classes. So very practically, one of the requirements of this class is you have to have 15 encounters over the course of the semester, which runs out to about once a week. If you don't do at least four, you automatically fail the class regardless. If you don't do all 15, you can't get an A regardless. It's just an encounter with someone that you don't know, that you get the conversation around the spiritual matters. It doesn't mean you, that they have to be saved. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Your job is casting seed, right? And it always happens, at first when I tell them this requirement, there's a little bit of shell shock look on their faces. 
But as they began doing it, I said, I'll never forget one, one of our students. She was an Angolan young lady. She goes, Doc, I've got a problem. I said, what's your problem? It was all right. She goes, now, every time I'm looking at someone, I'm saying, how do I tell that person about Jesus? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, Rosario, that's not a problem, man. And every, on the first lecture of the week, we would have report time. How's it going this week? How's it going? And, and hers would always begin while I was riding on the bus. And everybody just starts laughing, you know. But the idea is holding accountability, creating something. And then their big project is to write a, an evangelism program for their church. So that requires for them to meet with their pastor and talk about what's going on. And so for the next year, what can they do? It requires them to map their community, which I teach them how to do that, so that they can execute, see where there's pockets of darkness, so that they can engage that. One of my students, I was going to, to uh, his church, and he's got on the wall in his office his whole year program of how, what they're doing for this year. And everybody in their church knows that program. And they're following, this is our evangelism outreach program for this year. And the results that we're seeing... It's not only people coming to Christ. I think the first year we did, we saw about 70 people come to Christ from the one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, but they also have to do or join another church in some form of outreach. So one year, I was teaching in two classes. We saw almost 300 people come to Christ. It was really exciting. But we've also seen the church plant come out of that and small groups come out of that. Because suddenly, but what gets me most excited is we're seeing a, a, a shift in culture among the students where evangelism is norm. And they hold each other accountable. It's really exciting. So it's a regular part of, cell, when we have cell group time, evangelism and sharing of what's going on is a normal part of conversation. And for me, that is one of the most incredible, incredible op, uh, things that we've seen. Now, I don't do, I don't teach the systematic courses, but again, you can see similar ideas. If you're doing Christology, can they write a sermon or Bible studies on Christology? How would they, and then have them teach it? Or The idea is, is move from classroom to application. Now, within our, in our context, we've had one of the big developments is um, the Department of Education is required that our final year look very different from the other years because it's supposed to be the honors year. So one of the things that we've had to do is we have a research project, but one of the big things that we've done is revamp the internship program. And, and I don't do that, so I've asked actually Godfrey. His, that's been his task. If he'll come and just share in about five minutes how that looks and how that's been revamped. And so because it's really one of the climactic points for the students in this point of application and point of engagement. So Godfrey, if you just come. Uh, this is the time when... A summative assessment takes place when I check up actually what Ronnie thought is actually applied in context. Um, I, I love what John Swinton says. He says, spirituality is always a product of community. Uh, spirituality is something we do together. We need one another in order to be spiritual. And that's what the, uh, the internship course seeks to do. Uh, taking the three and a half years of, of theoretical information given to the student, uh, and then make application uh, to, to that. Um, the internship program is a supervised program of basically 14 weeks where uh, we literally set the student in a particular local church context. Now, this is not internship be behind a photocopying machine, uh, like most uh, church programs actually want their students to do. The 14-week uh, uh, program is intensive in the sense that the student mix, meets with the, super, uh, the supervisor, that's me, uh, the CTBS supervisor, uh, once a week for five hours. And there we sit and we interact uh, with the week's program, and then for the next 25 to 30 hours, he meets with his field supervisor, which is his pastor. So there's accountability to the seminary, at the same time, accountability uh, to the church in, in which he locates uh, himself. Uh, in the course of the 14 weeks, there are sessions, and each week we deal with a particular session, and the first week, for example, we deal with the call of a pastor, what it is to be expected when you receive a call from a church, and how do you actually engage that. Uh, the second week, we'll discuss possibly the perspective of the distinction between induction and ordination, and what's the theology uh, behind uh, that. And so uh, there is always informed, the student is always informed uh, theologically, and then there's in-depth analysis and critical analysis concerning uh, that which the, stu the student seeks uh, to understand. So these crit 30 critical analysis or assignments uh, that the student is given 
is, is engaged critically in order that the student understands the activities of a pastor's day-to-life engagement in the local church. So the philosophy of this particular internship program is to enable the student to, to make this transition from the classroom uh, into a ministerial setting. Now, it is said that uh, the ministry is the only setting where a, a student, the moment he gains a particular ministry, is expected to leave. Uh, you don't find that anywhere else where automatically you're expected to give leadership. And an internship program prepares the student for such, uh, for such a, a transition. And so within the, local, uh, within the church local setting, under the supervised uh, uh, mentorship of a localized uh, pastor, uh, the student is set. So uh, the training literally takes place within a localized church setting. And the student then engaging that setting seeks to, uh, to ask uh, four simple uh, questions, again using Swinton, he asks the question, what seems to be happening? What is the current practice of the church? Why do I do what we do? Why do we perform baptism in this particular way? Or do we actually perform believer's baptism or adult baptism? And these are some of the questions they seek to address when they engage these activities. And how do they do it? They observe uh, the local pastor. Why do the pastor perform his duties in a particular way? Observation. And then they ask the question, what is actually happening? And there's this empirical, empirical data that is co collected. Uh, every week there's a report given concerning what they have observed the pastor do. Then there's critical theological reflection on that. Why do we do that? Why is the pastor doing that? And in this uh, critical reflection, then develop a, a theology. And ultimately, what should be happening? If I had to do this, how would I do it differently? If I'm called to a local church, and if I'm the pastor of this local church, how would I do baptism maybe differently? Or how, will, how would I do a mission service differently? Or how would I preach uh, differently? So the internship program seeks to situate uh, the, the student in a local church, giving him a bird's eye experience and view of a, the, the pastor's day-to-life experience, uh, allowing him to make mistakes under, uh, under uh, the supervised vision of the minister or the senior pastor of a local church and under the supervision of uh, CTBS. And uh, so far, uh, we've produced some excellent pastors who went out and planted some great churches and doing great ministry and mission for Christ. But I, I hope that the idea is to see is that it, it's about how do we help create accountability so that not only for the students among themselves, but between us and the student, so that there, there can be this confidence of transition. So planning is intentional. The way you look at your curriculum, the way you plan your, your coursework. The last P that I mentioned is, is presence. Um, and if you remember, uh, Dr. Chuga earlier told us we need to live it. And that's part of this issue, part of this dynamics. Um, we have this, th this one question that's on our course evaluation. At the end of the semester, the students answer that. And this is, what, this is one of those questions that's on there. How well does the lecturer know you as a person? Now, you may think that has no value for your teaching, but we disagree. We think it is an important question. And one of the things that we will find that, that, if, um, that if we find that, that a number of students are saying, none of the, none of the lecturers know me, well, well, that's a problem. One of the things that we've encountered over the years is we've seen a shifting in our students from day students, which is full-time, to evening students who are working and then coming part-time. And we actually hit the tipping point where we have more evening students than day students. And one of the problems is we are not learning the students as well as we did when they're in the day. So that's a question. How do we do better? How do we engage it so that we can know the students better? One of the things that we do, I'm sure as many others do, as when students enter, we have a, a, an interview with them, you kind of hear their heart, their, their testimony of call. So we do always know at least a little bit, but we need more than that. It's not enough. Now, I think one of the things that we have is our formal structures within our setting, and I think within most seminaries that you can use for, to help enhance presence. As I mentioned, one of the things that we have are cell groups led by the faculty members. Where, so once a week, you're with cell groups. Uh, we organize it so the first week of the month it's by your group, but then otherwise it's a mixed group. And so we have a chance to uh, walk with the students, to uh, have a devotional time, have, uh, talk about prayer, uh, see what's going on. We also have, a, a, not only our chapel, our students preach regularly as well as faculty. So we have worship times, communion. 
Then we also have some very, very um, relaxed formal time st structures like a day camp. Early in the semester, we have a, a whole afternoon where all, all the families get together and we have just goofiness and fun and, and, a, and so a braai, and, which is like cookout for those who aren't South African. But I think more important is the, some of the informal structures. You know, we're, here we talk about uh, mentoring, making yourself intentional with your students to walk with those students, you know, and, and you'll find very often students who have, will, will kind of seek you out as, 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 um, as there's a common interest, a church plant or a ministry in a certain area. Um, times of counseling, we have that, that open door that we heard before. Now this has shifted a bit because over the last couple of years we've appointed uh, one of the faculty is now serves as chaplain and so does more of the counseling, but you still will have those moments and, and for me, the Greek class, because I realize a lot of them stress over Greek. So at the end of the year, we have a, a Greek braai at my house, and I teach them how to play croquet, and they bring their families, and, and they all say, oh, so you're the one that's causing my, you know, to lose sleep. I'm sorry, you know. <laughs> I still remember there was one of, a, um, one of the requirements I give is, is they have to read, you know, so read a thousand pages or whatever. And so one of our students was trying to catch up. And she's in the midst of it, and her daughter asked her, so when did you get this assignment? <laughs> She's like, oh, no, you go away. So anyway. But I think one of the other exciting things is sometimes is, is the way we can participate with students. One of the things that we have is Mission Week every week, or every year the students go, and, and, and it's fun to go and jo join them on their team just for one day here, one day here, so that you're out walking together as you're doing evangelism or, or whatever. Um, and then there's that opportunities to do training in their churches, to uh, participate with them. Uh, in preaching and teaching or whatever they're needing and you can kind of come alongside uh, one of the more exciting things for me is also contact with former students one of the advantages of having been there for a long time now is I have students who are all over southern Africa and so one of the ways that we have a lot of contact is Facebook and WhatsApp and emails or doc I got this question and I'm excited when that one always says when I'm reading my Greek Bible I always like when they start that way um, but it's just a way of keeping connection and maintaining it so they know if I have a question of ministry that I can, I can seek you out. I can, I can ask those questions. And, and again, the invitation is to come. Would you come and do a training session or teach or, or lead? And that's, that's really always, always an exciting point. And one of the things that I love from this is it creates a joint accountability. I mentioned the evangelism course. What I failed to say is, is I do the same assignment. So that we, I have the 15 conversations. And, I do, and so they always check on me. Doc, how are you doing on yours? <laughs> and so it's, it's one of those accountability times. And so I think that helps build, as, as uh, uh, Ryan had said earlier, um, focus on the Paul-Timothy relationships. Part of this time is to develop those, to focus, focus on those, and see those moments grow so that it's never just about that classroom time for us from 8 to 2, whatever your times are, but it's about this calling to equip for God's glory and his purposes. So how are we fitting in that? So, so as we come to the end then, here are some things I want you to do in your groups briefly, and then uh, we'll have time because I know we've got more to do. But first of all, I want you to share in your groups, what are some of the best practices at, at where you're at? What do you see as these are ways that are really working well in getting to to the, the field. And so start with that one. And so I'm going to just give you a couple minutes, just share with each other for that, and then move to the second question, which is perhaps ask of one another. Here's a, where I'm struggling. And then, and then after about five or so minutes, uh, we're going to have time for praying for one another.